to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the bible says god wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 4. We welcome you today to the Gospel of Christ program. In this series of lessons beginning today, we're going to be discussing the great subject of salvation. And friend, how good it is to know that the God of heaven wants all men to be saved. 2 Peter 3 and verse 9, the Bible says that the Lord is not slow concerning His promises as some men count slowness, but He's long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to a knowledge of the truth. 2 Peter 3 verse 9, and so God wants everybody to be saved. Jesus has delayed or is slow in His coming in that God wants to give all men time to repent. And so today, we're going to think about God's plan for salvation. As always, we again welcome you to our study today. If you'd like to have a copy of this lesson or any of our lessons that we present, you can visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. You can find a variety of Bible study materials there, as well as all our video and audio available. And from our website, you can request a free CD or DVD of today's lesson or any of our lessons. And we always encourage our viewers and listeners to visit the uh, Church of Christ in your area. If you'd like to study more from the Word of God, like to have a, a Bible study, personal Bible study, they'd be happy to sit down with you and study from the Word of God. Let's then think about God's plan for salvation. The Scripture says in Titus 1 verse 2, of Christians that they are living in hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie, listen to this now, promised before time began salvation began in the mind of God before the world was created, before the first second on the clock of time ticked. God had already formulated and made a plan of salvation to save mankind. Uh, listen to the words of 2 Timothy chapter 1 beginning in verse number 9. Of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. God set that plan in motion before time began, and it is now revealed in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And friend, as you think about God's plan to save man, God's plan to save me and you, friend, that plan is motivated. It, it, what, what brings that plan out in the mind of God, in the heart of God, is His love for each and every one of us. Why does God want to save man? Because the God of heaven is love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. And, and that love is so beautifully illustrated in the Scriptures. When you think about God's love, think about passages like these. 1 John 3, verse 1, John says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we can be called children of God. What a privilege it is to be taken from being a, in sin and a child of the devil and become a child of God. What caused that? The love of God. Think about the beautiful verse of John 3, 16. God so loved the world, 
He gave. Gave what? His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Uh, you think of passages like Romans 8, 39. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And then you think about God's plan directly connected to that love. While we were still without strength, in due time, or as some versions say, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone might dare to die. Now listen to this. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, verses 6 through 8. And so it's that, that love of God that, that motivates God to want to send His Son and to save man from sin. Uh, listen to the words of 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 and 15. The love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that they who live should no longer live, by, live for themselves, but live for him who died for them and rose again. That, that, that love is what ought to motivate. It motivated God and it's what ought to motivate Christians, people to become children of God. You know, when I think about God's plan of salvation, in heaven from eternity and, and, and the magnitude and the wonder of that plan, I can't help but think of 2 Corinthians 8, verse number 9. Paul said it this way. Listen to these beautiful words. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. What do you mean we know, Paul? Though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that we through His poverty might be made rich. Look at God's plan. Look at what Christ did. Look at what He left and all that He faced and suffered. And, and why did He do that? So that one day we could live in heaven with God. Now as we think today about this plan and about the unfolding of that plan that's motivated by God's great love, friend, let's realize that this plan it's very clearly illustrated for us in the sacrificial death of God's Son for our sins. How did the plan of God begin to unfold? What, what's directly related and connected to that plan? Friend, we can't separate the fact that God sent His Son to be the sacrifice for our sins from God's eternal plan for man. You know, you think about what Jesus gave up, but you also have to think about what He sacrificed here on this earth so that we could have the hope of heaven. Do you remember 1 Peter 2.24? The Bible says this, Christ, He Himself, bore our sins in His own body that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. Referencing back, no doubt, to Isaiah 53, verse 4, He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. By His stripes we are healed. What made salvation available? Friend, the sacrifice of Jesus is key and integral to that great sacrifice or to that great plan of salvation. If Jesus had not left heaven, if He would not come to this earth, if He hadn't went to the cross and died for each one of us, there would be no salvation. When you think about these words, we have to understand how God put that plan into action of His own free will. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that we know God's salvation. We know His sacrifice and that though, though He gave up so much, He was willing to do that for each and every one of us to be saved. And so we see, although Christ committed no sin and of Himself, He made Him, God made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf. There's the idea. God loved each and every one of us so much that He sent His Son to be the offering for our sin. You know, as John saw Jesus approaching, he's uh, in the area of Galilee, Judea. He sees Jesus approaching. Here's the first thought that comes to John's mind. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We're not redeemed by incorruptible things like silver and gold from the aimless conduct handed down by tradition from our fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. As a lamb without spot and blemish, He was foreordained before the foundations of the world 
but was manifest in these last times for us. 1 Peter 1 verses 18 through 20. And so when you think about that great sacrifice and you think about the plan of God, think about Jesus as an integral part in that plan. Think about what He, what he suffered for each one of us. Take your mind back to, to Calvary, to Golgotha, to the trial, to the crucifixion. He was mocked. He was beaten. He was spit upon. They brought that, that whip across the back of Jesus numerous times. They struck Him on the head that had a crown of thorns on it with a reed. Uh, they said, if you're the Son of God, uh, call down angels, as it were, come down from the cross. His hands and His feet were nailed to a, a, a cruel cross, and He hung suspended between heaven and earth for me and you. Friend, that's the love of God. That's the plan of God in the salvation, in the sacrifice of Jesus that makes salvation available. Jesus tasted death for every man. Hebrews 2 verse 9, He is the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice for our sins, but not for ours alone, for the sins of the whole world. 1 John 2 verses 1 and 2. And then as we think about God's plan from eternity for salvation, Friend, I want you to think about uh, the wonder and the splendor, uh, the beauty of forgiveness that is related to that plan. What makes this plan of Jesus' sacrifice so wonderful and so great? Friend, because of His sacrifice, every sin, every word that I've spoken that wasn't right, every deed that I've done that I know I shouldn't have done, every thought that has entered my mind that was not according to the will of God, Every one of those, the Bible teaches, can be completely removed. You see, it's that sin that separates man from God. Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2, The Lord's ears not heavy that He cannot hear, His arms not shortened that He cannot save. What's the problem then? Your sins and your iniquities have separated you from your God. What is it that's going to remove sin and make it possible? Obedience to the gospel and the sacrifice of Jesus promises us we can be forgiven of our sins. Uh, I love the words of Psalm 103, verse number 10 through 12. The Bible says, The Lord's not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. If I've obeyed the gospel, if I've submitted to God's plan, then friend, I've not got what I deserved for sin. If you, O Lord, were to mark iniquities, who could stand? Listen to this, though. But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. Psalm 130, verses 4 and 5. God says in Hebrews 8, verses 12 and 13, I'll be merciful to their sins and their lawless deeds. I'll remember no more. Micah said, God will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Micah 7, verses 18 and 19. But let me remind you of it in this way. From the words of Jesus, as you think about the beauty and the splendor of forgiveness, think about Jesus as He institutes the Lord's Supper. In Matthew chapter 26, verse number 28, Jesus took that, that fruit, of the, fruit of the vine and he, he said to His disciples, Do this in remembrance of Me. And He said, This is My blood of the new covenant shed for many for the forgiveness, for the removal of sins. Peter stands up with the eleven for the very first time, preaches the good news of Jesus Christ. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Acts 2.36 they, they realized the sin problem and they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And here's the answer. Listen to the beauty of it. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Thank God that a plan has been made. Jesus is the sacrifice that was made, and by obedience to God's plan of salvation, I can be forgiven of every sin that I might have committed. But friend, we also see in God's plan of salvation from eternity, that that plan has been revealed to us in the words of the Bible. How would I know about Christ? 
How would I know about His great sacrifice? How would I know about, about the, the, the beauty and the wonder of forgiveness that comes from obedience to the gospel? I'd never know that if it weren't revealed in the Bible, the words of God. Thank God for His message of salvation that has been recorded in the words that we have in the Bible. You see, this book, it's not man's opinions. These are not people 2,000 years ago, uh, their ideas. This book, the Bible, is the words of God who created the whole world. That's what the Bible says. 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, is God-breathed, and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. 2 Peter 1, verse 3 says that according to God's divine power, He has given to us everything we need for life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him. When I read the Bible, when I study God's Word, friend, this book, the words of God, has everything I need to be saved. You know, when, when Matthew wrote, or when John wrote, or when Isaiah wrote, or, or when Paul wrote, they weren't writing their own ideas or thoughts. They were under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Listen to a couple of passages with me. 2 Peter 1 Verses 19 through 21, the Bible says, Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. It wasn't of their own origin. No, the Holy Spirit of God was the force behind these men. And when they spoke or wrote, what they spoke and wrote down was the Word of God. Now, I know that's the case for 1 Corinthians 14. Verse number 37 says this, Paul said, If any man thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge the things that I write to you. Listen to this now. Paul said, The things that I write to you, these are the commandments of God. Paul, when you wrote 1 Corinthians, when you wrote uh, 1 and 2, when you wrote any of these books of the Bible, was that your own idea? No. You've got to realize if you're going to be a prophet, if you're going to be spiritual minded, you've got to realize what I wrote. These are God's commands. Friend, that's how we need to look at the Bible. The Bible is not human invent of human invention, human origin, human ideas. These are the words of Almighty God. And friend, the Bible is truth. It's all truth that we need on matters of salvation. Jesus prayed to the Father in John 17, 17, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Jesus had already taught us the importance of truth in John 8, 32. You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And friends, Psalm 119, verse 160 says, The entirety of God's Word is truth. And it's the Word of God that makes it possible for us to be saved. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, Paul said. Why not? It's the power of God unto salvation. James, the half-brother of the Lord, told Christians to receive with meekness the implanted Word which is able to save your souls. 1 Peter 1.25, we're born again by the Word of God which lives and, and, and abides forever. That's the power and the efficacy of the mighty Word that we have recorded in the Bible. And so, as you think about God's divine plan of salvation, it's integral to see the sacrifice of Jesus is key to that being available. That sacrifice offers man the forgiveness of every sin he's committed by obedience to the gospel. And that message of Jesus and forgiveness is recorded for every one of us right here in the Bible. But friend, here's the good news as well. This sacrifice... Uh, the forgiveness of sins, the, the God's plan of salvation being recorded in the Bible. If I will submit to that, if I will obey it, and if I will live my life by the Word of God every day, then friend, God's eternal plan of salvation assures every person that they can live in heaven with God for eternity. I want you to think about some of the beautiful passages 
that illustrate the reward of a Christian life. Matthew 25, 46, Jesus said, The righteous will go away into eternal life. Don't you want to live with God? Don't you want to be in heaven one day with the saints of old? Be a, a free from the sin and the heartache and the pain that we face today? You know, when you think about the beauty of heaven, uh, Jesus illustrated it in Matthew 6, verse 9. Jesus taught His followers to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven. What makes heaven great? God. The Father is in heaven. And if God's in heaven and God is our Father, how wonderful that's going to be. I'm reminded of the promise Jesus made to His disciples in John 14, 1 following. Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Were it not so, I would have told you. And then he said this, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Where, where did Jesus go? He went to the right hand of the Father. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. And Jesus says, I'm going to come again known as the second coming of Christ, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13 through 18. When He comes again, He's going to receive the kingdom to the Father, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24 through 26. And friend, I have that promise of living with God in heaven for all eternity. I love the words of Hebrews 4, verse 9. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. And so as you think about God's plan, what does that plan require of each one of us. As I think about the great sacrifice that was made, the, the marvelous love of God, how that every sin can be forgiven, and I think about the Word of God and living in heaven, what does God require of each person to do what's right in His sight? Well, friend, the Bible teaches that we must obey our God. We must submit to and obey what God teaches us in His Word. Can you really say, I want you to think about this with me. You ask yourself this question. Can I say that I love God and not do what the Bible tells me? Well, let's let Jesus answer. John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. If I don't do what God says, then friend, we say this as kindly and lovingly as we know how. If you're not doing what Christ says, and you're not doing what God says, and you're not following the Bible, you don't love God. Not the way Jesus said. John 15 verse 14, Jesus said, You're my friends if you do whatever I ask. Think about the words of Christ in Matthew chapter 7, verse number 21. Jesus said, It's not everybody that looks up into heaven and says, Lord, Lord, that's going there. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. To, to be pleasing to God, to respond properly to the eternal plan of God of salvation, I've got to do what God says. Jesus asked this question to the, uh, to the hypocrites and to the religious elite of His day. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say. Can I call Jesus my Lord and then not follow what He asks or do what He says? Now that's a misunderstanding of what Lord means. If Jesus is our Lord, Acts 2 verse 36, that means we recognize He's the Master. We recognize He's the one over us. And if that's the case, then I must submit to and follow the teaching of Jesus Christ. This is why the Bible says in Hebrews 5 verses 8 and 9 that Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. Friend, we ask you today as you think about in your own heart and in your own mind, as you think about God's eternal plan to save mankind, we ask you kindly to think about whether you have obeyed the words of the Bible, the commands of Jesus, and the voice of God. What must a person do to obey God's eternal plan of salvation? Well, friend, the Bible doesn't make it difficult. I've got to hear the message of salvation. Faith comes by hearing. That word faith is kind of the idea of, of belief or trust. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10, 17, without hearing, 
there can be no faith. And so hearing is essential. But once I've heard the message, am I willing to believe in Jesus? If Acts chapter 8, when Philip is uh, teaching the Ethiopian unit the gospel, Acts 8, verse 36 through 38, the, verse 34 through 38, they come to a certain water. He's been teaching about Christ. Here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? If you believe with all your heart, you may. Do you believe that Jesus is God's Son? Would you be willing to repent, turn from sin, and turn to God? Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Would you confess the name of Jesus before men? Romans 10 verse 10 says, With the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then, just as they did, the very first time the gospel is preached, would you be baptized to be saved, and in order to have your sins washed away? There's a lot of people who teach that uh, you're saved and then you're baptized later. That's not what Jesus said and it's not what Peter said. Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Peter on the very first day of Pentecost, on the very first sermon on Pentecost said, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of of your sins. And so, have you obeyed the gospel? Have you become a child of God? Friend, we want you to know today that God wants you to be saved. Verse Timothy 2 verse 4. He wants you to come to a knowledge of His truth and live with Him in heaven for all eternity. God's made salvation available. He has uh, done His part and made that available for everybody. But I have to respond properly in obedience to the gospel. Friend, God loves you. Uh, we love you and want nothing more from you than for you to go to heaven. That, that's our motivation today. We're talking about, we're thinking about, we're, we're setting out before us what the Bible says on salvation because we love men and women souls and we want you to go to heaven. If you've never obeyed the gospel, friend, we urge you to do that. Your soul is the most important possession you have. Accept God's offer of salvation and obey the gospel while you have time and opportunity. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.